Methodist, Methodist Conference at the same same week, and then they had a regional camp of the uh, Salvation Army, and then at the same time they had the King's birthday, so they put on extra flights. So there was a lot of Tongans going to Tonga, and uh, um, yeah, but it was a, a wonderful time. Thank you for your prayers. I get confused because they don't know that I'm. You know, so they talked to me in Tonga and I said, I'm sorry, I can't understand you. I'm um, Samoan. I had to tell them. Even when I checked to come back, and the, the lady was talking to me in Tonga. I said, I beg your pardon. Um, I think there's Tongan in, 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 in heaven. And I, think, I think we'll speak Tongan and Maori and Samoan and English and Polish and whatever. And everybody will understand everybody else. Right. I'll talk to you in Samoan, you'll, un you'll answer me in, in Portuguese, and we'll all understand each other. I think that's what heaven is going to be like. Praise God. It's going to be good. There will be no questions in heaven. All right. A lot of people said, I'm going to ask God a lot of questions. You are not going to ask God anything. <laughs> You're going to throw your crown on his feet and then worship him. Because the very thing that you are critical of on this side of heaven, you realize you were, hello? Um, hallelujah. And sometimes uh, we, everybody has an opinion on anything. It doesn't matter what it is. And it's amazing. Said, if you did this, if you did that, and then somebody, no, no, if you did that, and if you did this. Uh, and, and we've got all these ideas. And sometimes uh, we fight over our ideas and we uh, um, meet over ideas. And ideas are great so long as there's a grace that carries the idea. Amen. So even on the cross, when Jesus said, forgive them because they, don't know, they know not what they do, the rulers sneered at him. The crowd sneered at him. The soldiers mocked him. And uh, the guy on the cross blasphemed him. Everybody had a perspective. And then uh, the other thief said, uh, Don't you fear God that we are under the same condemnation? And sometimes... Uh, it's not wrong to have an idea. It's not wrong to have an opinion. I think we, we ought to have opinions. I think that's, a, that's the beauty of God creating us. And in part of God in us that uh, we actually can think and we actually say things. Hello? And uh, the Bible says, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heaven is above the earth... So are my thoughts and my ways higher than your ways. So where do we get those thoughts? We get them from the, from the word of God, from the Bible. And uh, if our thoughts are from the scriptures, then our disagreement will be minimized. And... Uh, I remember talking with a, a minister one time. They came to see us, and uh, they were both ordained. And uh, the wife said, uh, I don't want a biblical answer. I thought, she wants something that she likes, she can, she can, uh, 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 she can digest, but don't give me a biblical answer because many times we don't want biblical answer. But if we follow the scriptures, we'll find the freedom that God promises us that we just sang about. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So we're talking on more, and the more we talk on more, the more we, we realize that a lot of people... <laughs> Hello? But I said uh, a few Sundays back, I did not know when God spoke that word to me that I was going to be running around all over the place. There was a lot more to do. Hallelujah. And I could say no, 
The problem is God has not said no. <laughs> so sometimes uh, I'm here and there and uh, our, our music team, we need a lot more people here. And the more, they've had three retreats since the beginning of the year. And people just, uh, people think if they sing for one Sunday, they can just drop off and want uh, a month off because they sang one Sunday. Uh, more means more. Hallelujah. Are you all right? I'm just talking. I haven't preached yet. But there's a whole heap of life when we do what we're meant to be doing. We come and we see and we look and we observe, make an opinion. But if, we, if we're too busy doing what God called us to do, we won't have so many times to just look and see and then make an, give an opinion. Hallelujah. And we said uh, that God has more, but like I Bernard Tompkins said, uh, she said, uh, many people said, I lift, fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting in my soul. And she said this. God said, that's a thimble. Go get a bucket. Your thimble is full. <laughs> now, when she said that, now she said, I'm not sure if Iverna is still alive. She? She's not. But she was an elderly stateswoman of the gospel, and she can say whatever she wants. Amazing, amazing woman of God. But that's what she said. We, we want to be enlarged by God, and, and uh, we got a thimble, and we lift it up, and the thing is, oh, uh, go get a bucket. Hallelujah. And the reason God enlarges us is to enlarge our capacity for more. More from heaven so we can give out more, so we can do more. I think it was William Barclay who said, God wants to uh, work you so hard that you'll die. I have to find out. Uh, <laughs> So God wants to enlarge our capacity for more of God. Not just more stuff, but more of God. There is more of God to know. And when you get to heaven, there will still be more of God to know. We shared before, and I can share with you again. The reason the seraphims don't want to have a break the seraphims have been worshipping holy, 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 holy. <laughs> They've been saying holy forever, the seraphims and the cherubims. Why don't they go to Taupo for a break? <laughs> because there's nothing more beautiful in all creation than the creator himself and they don't say that robotically they don't say holy holy no no they will bow in awe because they see an aspect of god they had never seen before so they say holy and when they get up they see another aspect of god that they have never seen before and there's a holy then they get up and they see an, another aspect of god they've never seen before no, no um, snowflake since the beginning of time has been duplicated. Every single snowflake is different from another snowflake. 
And every one of them is in the form of a star. Now, even if we observe the snowflake, we say, whoa, no, whoa. Because millions and millions of snowflakes can fall in a few minutes when the snow falls. And not one of them is duplicated. Not a single one. Every single snowflake is unique. You can't duplicate it. It's on its own forever and ever. And yet they will drop. They will drop on the earth and disappear. So there is more of God for us to know and for us to do. And yet sometimes we get bored. It's not, boredom must drive us to know God more. Yeah. Hallelujah. Are you okay? Yeah. Is this all right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, sometimes I, I go away because it helps others to preach. As long as I'm here, I'll preach. <laughs> Someone said to me, you got that pulpit very, very, uh, uh, what did he, what did he say? You, you just like to, I said, uh, that's what, that's what God sent me here to do. So it's nice that I go and somebody else can preach. Did you enjoy Chris last week? Yes. Amen. Who preached before Chris? Oh, did you enjoy her? Oh, okay. So it's, it's nice to go away while others, you hear others. There's a whole lot of preachers in the church. Hallelujah. And it's wonderful to be able to go away knowing that the church will be fed, will be strengthened and encouraged. Hallelujah. Amen. <coughs> so let me, let me just, uh, I, I won't be too long, but uh, I just want to share a few thoughts. How does God enlarge us? Because God enlarges us, determined by our willingness. God always wants to enlarge us. But if you're not willing to be enlarged, then you're not a candidate for it. Because God is not going to force his will over you. But when you allow God to do stuff in your life, it is amazing the capacity that you're able to carry. Like we said, somebody gets up here, they sing for two weeks, and then they, I, I, I'm having a break. And uh, you, haven't, you have untouched potential that you will never be able to reach if that's the attitude of your thinking and your heart. As a man thinks... So he is. If you think you can do it, you can do it. If you think you can't do it, you can't do it. The two men that thinks one can do it and the other can are both correct. If you think it can't be done, it will not be done. If you think it can't be done, it can be done. But it's determined by us allowing God to enlarge our capacity. You are enlarged by distress. We've said that more than once. And God will bring distress or allow distress into the life. Not to destroy the life, but to enlarge the capacity of that life. Before the fire and after the fire are the same guys, but after the fire is a different dimension of authority and understanding of God. Before the, the lion's den and after the lion's den are two different capacities where a guy after the lion's den now is given greater and more authority to be able to function in the things that he is now able to do. Hallelujah. And many times we never get to the fire because we want to stay on the other side. And sometimes we never get to the lion's den because we want to stay on the other side. And our faith 
goes that way, and when it doesn't happen, we don't like it, and then we begin to criticize God and criticize others. But God wants you to go through the fire to realize that it can't burn you. We sing about that. God wants you to go through the flood to realize that it can't drown you. The Bible says, stormy winds can't fulfill the word of God. Now, it's a very, very simple thing. Jesus was on the boat. They were going to the other side. A storm came and the church panicked. Where was Jesus? Sleeping on the boat on a pillow. And when he got up, he calmed the storm. Why did he calm the storm? Because it's easier to calm the storm than to calm the church. Now, why did he want to go to the other side? Only he can answer that, but I can speculate. I can speculate from the Bible. Because when they got to the other side, and, and, and uh, John Cain said that very well when he was here. I don't know if you remember what he preached. They were panicking here in the storm. Got to the other side, there was a demonic guy. He had legions of demons. That 2,000 pigs went into... So they thought they had trouble here. And you got the other side, there's a guy. You know, you can't contain the guy. So... Maybe Jesus was going to the other side to meet that man. But that man, if the boat was going straight and no storm, that man, the boat will not hit the shores of where that man was. Stormy winds fulfill the word of God. So the storm actually detoured the boat and the boat ended up with a demoniac. But if the storm never came, the, the boat will go, hello? The Bible says stormy winds sometimes can fulfill the will of God, the word of God in your life, in my life. And while they were going straight, the storm detoured them to find the demoniac of Gadara. But our capacity, so they were given a storm, even though God did not send that storm. We, we talk about it. You remember that? The devil sent the storm. Why? Because God, Jesus rebuked the storm. It wasn't sent by God. God can't rebuke God. But Jesus rebuked that storm. So the, the source of the storm was from the devil. And yet God still used the storm to detour the boat to where the demoniac was. But the storm was allowed to... Give the disciple the capacity to handle it. Yeah. And when Jesus got up, he said, what's wrong with you? Where's your faith? But they were given the storm so that they are able to calm the storm. How do you do that? By faith. Now there was a storm that, that God sent. And he sent it to a... A guy that was meant to go to Nineveh and he went to Tarshish. That storm was sent by God. So God can actually send us storms. The devil sent storms. God sent storms. And the storm God sent was to bring the prophet to go the right way. Nineveh is up there and Tarshish is over there. So, hello? Hello? And God sent the storm, but then Jonah read Matthew chapter 8. And he read it and said, well, Jesus slept in the storm. You might say, well, it wasn't written then. I know it wasn't written then, you know. But Jonah slept in the wrong storm. Because even though he slept, the storm goes, hmm. Sometimes the purpose of God is still the same. Whether the devil sent a storm or God sent the storm, the purpose of God, God works all things for our good. Are you learning something? <laughs> so the storms help to enlarge our capacity for more of God and understand who we are 
in carrying out the authority God has given to us. And many times, our capacity is enlarged by pain. But we don't like pain. We want to manage it very well. Let me ask you a question. Can you ever have a baby without pain? You can't. So intimacy is pleasurable, but the greater the intimacy, the greater the pain. You say, Pastor, can you explain that to me? If I'm so intimate with you and then something happened to our relationship, the pain is powerful. Sometimes it's almost unmanageable. That's why divorce is a horrible thing. You've been together with this person and something happened to the relationship. The pain of that is immense. You walk with a friend and they betray you. The pain of that is immense. You walk as a family and the family betray each other. The pain of that fractured intimacy is immense. So the greater the intimacy, the greater the pain that is possible to come when the intimacy is broken. The intimacy of having a child is amazing because you can't have a child without... The two of you can make a child, but the bringing forth out of that intimacy, a new life is formed, and the bringing forth of that new life is immense. Are you all right? That's why we said one time, I think more than once, if men ever have children, there will only be one child families. <laughs> Hello? But the point is, we are enlarged, and you can't have a child without enlargement. It enlarges your tummy, it enlarges the family, it enlarges relationship, but everything happens after that, but it comes out of intimacy and pain. Are you all right? Now let me give you two uh, examples of more that God had prepared for two people. There's a whole lot more in the Bible, but I just want to use two examples. When Ruth came from Moab, she, come, she came into a people that were not hers. And she came into a country that was not hers. But something had stirred in her heart regarding the God, this Jewish God. Something has stirred. So she's, she's walking with her mother-in-law. They have absolutely nothing. They've got no home, no house, no bank account, no nothing. So they are walking into a future with nothing but a hope and a faith in a God that's supposed to be faithful. And when she got to Bethlehem, Judah, and Naomi, her mother-in-law, said, uh, What are you all coming to see me for? I went out full. God has brought me back empty. I went out with everything, I came back with nothing. So Naomi never counted the girl as being somebody. She said, I came back with nothing. Went out full, came back with nothing. Even the girl was not even mentioned. It wasn't even here in her vocabulary. But the whole future of the nation and the world was in that girl. You're here because of that woman. You're here because of that girl. I'm here because of that girl. And she came, had nowhere to go to but the, 
the God that her parent-in-law had taught her about. And when she got there, she went to the field. And I like the word the, the king changed. He, she lighted on the fields of Boaz. You know what we said? Jacob lighted on a, a piece of real estate where it became Bethel. So Ruth lighted on the fields of Boaz, not knowing that these are special fields. And God in heaven, the master orchestrator, is a maneuvering, I don't like the word maneuvering, is orchestrating uh, circumstances for the girl to light upon this field of Boaz, an old man who's so rich, but he's not married. Why? Because Boaz's mom was also, hallelujah, like Ruth, a foreigner that came into the covenant people of God. And uh, Boaz's mother was a prostitute. So maybe the girls, now this is where I'm speculating, okay? Maybe the girls and the people that don't, don't, ah, go. He's the son of a prostitute. Forget it. The same thing they did with Chephthah, the son of Gilead. They kicked him out of the family because his mother was a prostitute. So here comes this girl, and immediately Boaz, the son of a prostitute, who probably went through the same persecution, the difficulty, the pain. And in that pain got enlarged that he came as a pro the son of a prostitute. Now he's the richest landowner. And yet they still don't want to hello. So he's now old and single. And saw this girl. And said to the foreman of the fields, who's the damsel? That's uh, Ruth, the Moabitish that came with Naomi. You know what uh, he said to her? I've been told about you. All the people in Wanganui are talking about you. How you come to the fields to help your mother-in-law. And then he said, when they, it's time to eat, clo draw close and eat of the bread. Draw close and eat of the bread. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Hallelujah. My blood is drink indeed. My flesh is food indeed. And here comes this orchestration of this marriage between the son of a prostitute and a foreign woman who has no business being in the covenant people of God. They got married, and uh, they gave birth to uh, Obed, who gave birth to Jesse, who gave birth to David, who gave birth to Jesus. Jesus, son of David. The man that hung on the cross was the great, 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 great grandson of that woman and uh, her husband. She was a foreigner. And he was the son of a prostitute. Don't tell me there's not more in God. We try to protect our patch. When God wants you to know that the planet belongs to you. That's the first example. We'll do the second, then we'll have communion. Woman come to church. She's married, but she's barren. Now, her husband has two wives. So, a man belongs to God. He goes to the Shiloh to offer sacrifices. But his heart was divided because there was uh, Hannah and there was Benina. 
So Hannah was the more godly of the two. And yet bore no fruit. And you would think that her heart was to work to God. And she comes to the temple speaking in tongues. Well, she didn't speak in tongues. She's just murmuring because she did not know how to express her heart. And the, the, the pastor said, hey, get out of here. You're drunk. She said, I I'm not drunk. I'm a woman with a heavy heart. And large in distress. I've asked God for something. And God has withheld it. The Bible is very clear. God closed her womb. The priest realized that the woman was telling the truth. said, go home. May God grant your prayer. She went home, began to sing a few songs, <laughs> hallelujah, and then she got pregnant. Enlarged by distress. When she got pregnant, the Bible says the glory of God had left the temple. It was Ichabod. But God saw the woman in distress and gave her a child and her promise was this. I, I wanted a son, but it's not for me. I want a son. I want to give the son to you. And Samuel was born. And when he was born, he was given to God. And every year she'll go up to Shiloh and sew a, a jacket and the boy was growing and the jacket was growing and <laughs> hallelujah. <coughs> that boy gave the nation a vision. That boy did things that only he could do. God spoke to the boy before the boy even understood the voice of God. And Samuel did things that no boy of his age should do. He began to act out as a priest. You're not supposed to do that unless you're 30. He was just a little kid and he had a linen ephod. Maybe in his own bedroom, he was practicing to be the priest of the Most High God because the priesthood that was there, the sons of that priesthood were no good. Yeah. So he was acting out and God probably looked down and even though God knew the thing was illegal, God loved it because he saw his heart. And the Bible says, everyone in the whole country from Dan to Beersheba knew that God had established Samuel as a prophet. And then this is what the Bible says about him. None of his words fell to the ground, but God fulfilled them. He didn't say none of God's word in his mouth. He said none of his words. Talk about more. A woman that was barren whose son gave the nation a vision, who God allowed to be a priest before time, was practicing to be a priest when he was a kid. God spoke to him, hallelujah, and set a vision for a country where God has left. And today, those two women, Ruth and Hannah, they are still speaking to us because we are part of their more. Because they trusted in God. Do you trust the same God? Because there are things happening today globally, nationally, 
Those are not nice things. But they are there so that the church can be enlarged. The womb of the church can give birth to something that is not from the world, but something from heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 